interesting talk on a quite complex topic. Um, yeah, we want to uh, dig into it a bit more, uh, yeah, deeper into the dollarization parts. That was our focus of um, our uh, discussion here. So uh, we're gonna summarize. Ah, yeah. Summarize uh, the chapter on dollarization, then uh, give you a bit more of definitions about dollarization to have them clear and then uh, add some stuff to your paper, not really criticize it, but uh, add case studies of Afghanistan and Ecuador, but also more general some uh, political economy factors and then um, summarize with our questions and our references. So um, to yeah, repeat the main idea uh, of your book. It's like uh, yeah, this dominance of the monetarist view of money, uh, where money is neutral and appears like as a medium, uh, mere medium of exchange, but indeed is like uh, more of a yeah, the money capital or like the finance capital in an international order, which is then reflected in this um, purchase power parity, where the uh, yeah U.S. dollar appears as uh, international unit of account. With that, you show in your chapter 10 of the book then that there are three generations of crisis. We already heard that, which are not different kind of crisis, but more stages of uh, crisis uh, with the crisis in Mexico in uh, 1982, where the dollarization of the public treasuries took place and the uh, government had external debt denominated in um, the dollar. And then with the Volcker shock and capital flight, um, the, yeah, the key dynamic appeared um, with the dollar piso contradiction. In the 90s then, we had this dollarization of private markets. And um, yeah, where private markets were dollarized and then uh, with dollar influx and political events and other instabilities, uh, we had uh, capital outflows uh, flows, and then a liquidity crisis not um, yet due to this market reversal. And then in the late 90s, the dollarization of the whole financial system uh, with banks relying on like the dollar as uh, money capital and then as like a trigger this over indebtedness and the coupling to the dollar triggered another currency crisis um, which was then connected to a bank liquidity crisis and this connection is like quite important that it's not only a bank liquidity crisis but just was possible through this currency crisis um, and I think um, to like have a big yeah big better understanding of dollarization we put some definitions about that here um, where, again, you also uh, talked about that, the dollar is used for any of the classical functions of money. His redox authors would, might add to that, that there's also this means of finance of uh, money. And uh, yeah, we talked about that quite a lot in this different crisis, that it's quite an important function of money. Um, yeah, and then we have uh, some different kinds of dollarization, um, which was yeah, also touched upon in, in your talk, but probably to have that clear, there's like one kind of a de facto dollarization meaning, or like that there's an unofficial dollarization meaning that there's a significant share of res uh, residents or different kind of actors that hold wealth in a uh, form of foreign currency dominated assets. Um, or like you could also talk about other, um, yeah, kinds of measurements to that dollarization. And that's also one question we would uh, ask you what this different kinds of dollarization has to do with like our like criticism of uh, dollarization because you already talked about like different kind of money uh, state uh, debt money um, or like yeah what the different kinds of dollarization and how to measure it have uh, for an effect on our criticism of dollarization um, and there's also then the other kind of like a more straightforward kind of dollarization where you have a de euro dollarization or full dollarization where a country completely abandons its own money where this problem of measuring dollarization is not really uh, present anymore. And um, then we want to add some political economy factors, which is more like a yeah addition of uh, your thing or like a question we will also ask you. Uh, we have this thing or like this concept of a currency hierarchy um, where like the dollar is at the top and then on yeah, the lower end we have like uh, currencies of the um, yeah, developing countries and also more on the top probably the euro and uh, these uh, currencies um, but then you also touch upon like political events in the countries that have an effect on the uh, dollarization tendencies or dollarization processes 
And there we also see that there's this hegemonic conflict on the international scale, like MERS itself on the national scale, and there's a choice of the national elites and other actors to dollarize or not to dollarize, as for example Ian Erz shows in the case of Georgia, where the national elite thought uh, it's nice to reorient ourselves more towards the US to have yeah, some possibilities, but we want to like probably criticize a bit that uh, it seems in your framework more of like an outcome of an international global arrangement and not of internal conditions also of this country and we want to ask why then countries all just dollarize through crisis and not only also internal actors have a like say in that and what do they add probably also to our analysis of dollarization tendencies. And probably to show that and depict that a bit more, we can talk about some um, case studies, and we will do that first with the case of Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, I would like to take a look at two cases of um, dollarization and currency crisis in Afghanistan and East Timor from a very general uh, political economic perspective. The first case, Afghanistan. In 2001, the um, intervention of the United States coincides with the collapse of the government and uh, back then Afghanistan was a very monetary fragmented economy where several types of currencies were used by different uh, peoples, groups and reg in different regions. After the war, IMF proposed Afghanistan for a full dollarization. Uh, however, um, the author this, they thought that it is very good for um, the inflow of the aid. It would be more faci it, it would facilitate the international um, community much better. However, the Afghan authorities, they looked uh, at this case a bit different. So they thought, uh, they looked at uh, Afghani as a national uh, symbol of uh, sovereignty. So that's why they thought that if we go for full dollarization, it would be very difficult for the Afghanistan to reverse. And also it would, it would be somehow difficult to implement some of the uh, economic policies and strategies that are somehow relevant to the Afghan economy itself. So that's why Afghanistan proposed another um, proposal, adopting a hybrid currency system where uh, I believe it was a smart uh, move because it, um, it allowed Afghanistan to print its own currency at the same time, use this stability of United States currency and um, this um, worldwide acceptance of US dollar. However, in the in, in course of time, Afghanistan uh, becoming one of the um, unofficial, let's say, dollarized economy from 65 to say 80 percent was a dollarized economy. However, after the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan has faced with four or five biggest crises uh, in, 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 let's say, in, twist, uh, in its uh, 20 years history. With the withdrawal of the United States, when the COVID hit and there was a national drought, and the collapse of the government, and at the same time, United States um, frozen ninety billion dollar of its foreign assets. So, and also, it also added um, uh, the fact that uh, Taliban they also banned the opium cultivation, where it brought one billion dollar loss in the income of Afghans. And in addition to that, they also banned the interest rates, uh, where the banks were not able to give loans to um, companies to businesses in order to run their businesses because it was perceived as illegal. It has really negatively affected the um, uh, currency and created a kind of currency crisis in the country. However, uh, recently in the last quarter, Afghanistan currency uh, has been, uh, um, uh, according to Bloomberg, it's the world's best performing currency in, in the last quarter, which is really interesting uh, case. Some of the strategies that um, the current uh, government has put in place uh, saved the currencies. Some of them they are called as highest limitations in the outflow of uh, US dollar from the country and at the same time increasing the domestic um, um, the exports has been increased. The trade between the country, the neighboring countries has also increased and this cash sending by the United Nations has also somehow saved uh, the economy. I just here would like to take a look at the Timor Leste's uh, case as well and somehow compare it with Afghanistan. Timor Leste's case is somehow similar to Afghanistan where they also in 2000, uh, they faced with somehow similar options as Afghanistan either to go for a full dollarization or to uh, print its own currency. However, Timor Leste <laughs> went for full dollarization and they accepted US as, a, as their official currency. 
Um, and like Afghanistan, um, the Timor Leste didn't have a very long history of uh, their national currency, and it, um, it's believed uh, this the symbolic value of uh, a national currency wasn't there because it has used for several centuries used the uh, Iskodu Portuguese um, uh, currency or Indonesian um, rupiah or even Australian US dollar, and also. Um, uh, the fact that there wasn't a very uh, functioning central bank in Timor-Leste after the occupation by Indonesia, and there was a desire in order to restore this uh, political and economical confidence after 23 years of occupation. So some of the reasons that it persuaded Timor-Leste to go for full dollarization. However, although it was a kind of um, uh, IMF uh, and the UN, UN tide, they uh, proposed Timor Leste to print its own money after a certain time, but um, Timor Leste maintained this dollarization policy because it helped to attract foreign investment and also it facilitated the trade between uh, neighboring countries. But here it's just uh, interesting for me that why Timor Leste just went for dollarization. However, uh, why, did it, why there was not a consideration of a yuan of China or Australian dollar? Because uh, those countries are the biggest trade um, partners of Timor-Leste, not the United States. So it's just interesting for me to take a look at it. So some of the implications we can get uh, from Timor-Leste, especially for post-conflicted countries, could be that, of course, dollarization is very beneficial for, the, um, for maintaining this uh, low inflation, uh, more stable financial sector, more stability, and also it avoids the capital outflow. In addition, it also decreases the transaction cost with international partners in the context of a, a common currency, where this, uh, there is a low risk of uh, currency crisis, which, of course, it has positive effect in trade and investment. And also the fact that it, um, it's effective in the balance of um, uh, bal balance of payment crisis. Of course, the dollarization it doesn't ensure the hundred percent of balance of payment. Uh, uh, however, um, it has it somehow helps the governments in order to uh, be more transparent uh, instead of just printing the money and increasing the inflation. Um, so. Um, in addition to that, we can say that um, one of the implications that we could say from Tim could take from Timor Leste was that. Uh, U.S. dollar was strong for the economy of Timor-Leste. It is very strong for any um, post-conflict country that goes for dollarization because, first of all, dollarization is strong and it could um, increase uh, or decrease the, um, uh, this export competitiveness of uh, the country. Uh, so it directly uh, negatively affects the trade deficit. And... Um, Everything comes with a cost. Of course, dollarization comes with a losing monetary policy autonomy and also the exchange rate flexibility. So in that case, governments and especially post-conflict countries need to uh, rely on their uh, fiscal policies, structural reforms, and also aids from foreign countries, which are some of the strategies they, they, can, ten, they, can, they can undertake, uh, which will be further explained by in Ecuador case further. Thanks. Well, we're going to look now at the Ecuadorian case, which is uh, an extreme case of complete dollarization. And it's also a case in which um, the aims of maintaining the, the external balance are prioritized over internal development projects. Um, the factors that contributed to the complete uh, dollarization of Ecuador were hyperinflation, currency devaluation, uh, um, a banking crisis and uh, the unsustainable fiscal policies that were undertaken to promote internal industrialization. Uh, most in Latin American countries did it from the 60s until late 90s, 80s, and then it collapsed because it was poorly designed. They didn't take into, into consideration the external constraints. That's something that was uh, mentioned a little uh, roughly in the MMT paper. Uh, these uh, factors resemble certain characteristics of the first and third generation crisis. Um, the policies that Ecuador put in place and that ended up adding more locks to the fire than actually solving the problem were uh, putting an exchange rate back to the dollar, 
uh, also the the government committed to uh, not uh, not financing the pub pub uh, the fiscal deficit with uh, money emission that is loans from the central bank. Uh, the third policy was um, that the central bank uh, was going to restrict the monetary supply. The, the, the central bank back then was doing monetary policy by controlling the money supply and not the interest rate as it, as it is down now. Uh, this with the objective to stabilize prices and also defend the exchange, the fixed ex exchange rate. Um, the, and as a result of that, uh, since the government cannot longer or was going to limit uh, the, the amount of the loans that it was going to receive from the central bank, it was seeking to get external financing. That's when, when the dollarization started to, let's say, the dollar started to penetrate more in the Ecuadorian economy. Uh, this to basically help uh, uh, shore up the, the foreign reserves. And, and also defend the, the, the exchange rate. Um, as a result of the loans that the government was receiving, some conditions are always put by the, by the creditors. One of them, mo most of the times, is structural reforms, privatizing state-owned enterprises that are running on deficits and are not making profits, and uh, also um, phasing out um, public policies that are aimed to industrialize, that you generally do not, uh, that generate inefficiencies rather than actually uh, incentivizing competitiveness. That's what it is said. Uh, as, a last re as a policy of last resort, Ecuador said that they would dollarize if none of the, none of the other function. That was a complete mistake to say because of course the, uh, the actors in the end just trusted that the, the, they didn't trust in the in the plan, you know. If you, you're going to say, "Yeah, we're going to dollarize anyway," if this doesn't work, of course, you're not sending a good message, uh, a confidence message. And in the end, of course, they dollarized, and the consequences were that they achieved the price stability, uh, the, the interest rates, uh, which is the internal price of money, uh, decreased. Uh, the, uh, the foreign investment increased also because uh, the uh, exchange rate uh, risk was reduced, basically eliminated, of course. Uh, also, fiscal discipline was achieved, uh, apparently. Uh, no, the central bank does, does, doesn't do any, any, basically any policy within the, the economy anymore. Of course, you, you lose all monetary policy independence. You cannot uh, control the money supply, you know, the, the exchange rate, the interest rate, anything. And, but this is the most important, important part. Basically, you don't have that uh, instrument that helps you mitigate the effects of external shocks when there are crises that propagate over the financial, uh, globalized financial sector. So in the end, these are the consequences that uh, we saw that a small open economy faces uh, to the inescapable hegemony of the dollar in this current system. So our questions are, how do you, how do you measure the do dollarization? Uh, how do you handle different kinds of do dollarization? Why do countries dollarize through crisis, which actors are important internally? How can archetypes of, gen of the generations be distinguished from each other? Rather th because in the case of Ecuador, we've seen that there is characteristics of it also the, the first generation and also the third one. And considering the economic influence of the BRICS, what are the possibilities and implications of these countries leading an effort to de-dollarize the global financial system? What strategies could they potentially employ to achieve this? Thank you.